Okay. I, I find some of the origins of the book absolutely, you know, we talked it at length about it, absolutely fascinating. So go for it. Okay, so here, so, so here, here we go. Life on the plants, I'll remind the, the, what the cover looks like. Um, it is set in 1997 and it concerns the Carter family's attempts to uh, resolve the estate and funeral of a elderly relative, great aunt Pearl, who died um, over that summer. And it's narrated by Ben Carter, who is recounting experiences when he was 14. So he's, we know that it's in the future for him or it, it, this is the distant past for him, but we don't really know where he is or how long ago it was, but he, yeah. he makes it clear that he's retelling this, this as, as, as ancient history for him. And um, so the majority of the novel is him just explaining how his family moved into Great Aunt Pearl's house, tried to clear the junk, uh, find the will, sort out the affairs, have the funeral, go home. They're, they're, in their mind, it's going to be a relatively simple, long weekend type deal. And it and ain't. <laughs> it very much isn't, exactly, yeah. yeah. It starts to go very, very wrong. So the when I set out to do this, so the, the, this was inspired by real events in as much as I was part of a kind of a family crew who went to um, my great aunt's house and we were found in precisely that situation where we had a lot of physical things we needed to deal with in this big big house that was crumbling because yeah. it had been neglected and she'd lived alone for a very very long time they've been very unwell um but in that within wrapped up within that was was this i this the fact that we were now responsible for um her estate and, and her will and, and, the, and the value of what she'd left behind but she had been a very unusual um she'd, she'd had quite unusual spiritual beliefs throughout her life and they had been refined in her later years into a quite a kind of um astrological um galaxial kind of um kind of belief system which was affected by a lot of different letters and, and correspondence she had from um, kind of mystical characters who would just send her letters and say hi you know we, we, we've been looking in the stars and we know that good things are going to happen to you and she'd reply to them and they say send us some money and we'll make sure that yeah good things definitely happen to you so we were finding all these papers with letters that she'd written promising things and um it was just this crazy mess and it felt like this weird conspiracy that we were kind of being swallowed up by because the the house and the scenario and, and and everything she'd kind of believed and and done had created this strange kind of web and i kind of went this is really weird i was reading at the time i was reading um inherent vice by thomas Pynchon. oh yeah yeah have you read it i don't know yeah really. a long time ago though yeah so um i was at the time my head was full of strange dentist cliques um kind of conjuring conspiracy so i began to kind of absorb that logic oh sorry about that um i began to the ghosts uh absorb that logic into um into what i was experiencing and then kind of went home and was going this feels a bit like a weird novel maybe i could kind of do something with that so i wrote this chapter i made a few notes and that was it i left it and then when the competition came around uh it's called pulp idol and everybody reads three minutes from a first chapter and they there, there are heats and then there's a final and the winner gets a round of applause and it kind of gets a bit of publicity um and i and i ended up being a runner-up and it it fundamentally gave me the confidence boost to say okay yeah i could finish that book it took me five years from that point but i don't think i would have ended up writing a novel without it mm -hmm. and i think it invited me to lose myself in material in a way that i hadn't previously had the the confidence or the sense of identity to really do because i'd considered myself to be a guerrilla writer who would kind of storm in all guns blazing and then get out as quickly as possible and i really liked short stories that did that where you just were just slammed really intensely and then it was over yeah. And I, I didn't think that I had the, the, the writerly 
muscles or the 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 or the lifestyle or the ability to concentrate well enough to really sustain um, a, a novel. Um, but I kind of slowly just set about proving myself wrong, really. And I had to break it up into relatively small chunks. It's not, it, it, this is quite flattering, the, the, the width of the book. It's not actually a very long book. Uh, although it's, the, the, one of the books that I'll come on to talk about in a sec that I have here, it's, it's substantially mm -hmm. fatter than The Cement Garden. Although yeah. perhaps the same word count, I think. But I, I, um, I, I had to break this down. And I realized I didn't have the, um, uh, probably the, the, the core narrative of what was happening. What I wanted to do was put the characters in the house and then let it melt down around them. I kind of had this entropic logic where they would be going, it's all going to be fine. And the kind of existential scenario would be just going in the complete opposite direction and things would fragment and decay their relationships would, be, would decay and the physical environment would decay they'd think they were getting on top of it but it would just dismantle itself around them but I realized that scenario the way that I was writing Ben's voice it wasn't really kind of sustaining it wasn't going to sustain a, 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 the, the book on its own it, it, I kind of kept going well I could try this it kept not working it needed another layer and I needed to bring in the um this idea of the of the letters and the correspondence yeah. that was that was happening so what you get through as you know having read it um you get ben's recounting of events that kind of take you through the 10-day period and sort of splicing well, that up you, sorry it, it, when i spoke about this book how it had sort of four equivalences yeah. operating at the same level of significance i feel that about your book in that you've got the sort of coming of age Boy's story. He's there with his father and his extended family. Yeah, difficult that all is. You've got the, the the house moving stuff, which I've seen done really badly. There's a book called Dodge Rose by an Australian called Jack Cox, who wrote it as a modernist work, and it is basically a, very, a similar premise: two women who don't really know each other, young women, move into a house belonging to one of their aunts or great aunts. To sort out their affairs but that's all there is to the book other than the sort of crazy modernist stuff which doesn't work so there's right. lots, and lots and lots of description about the interior which yours has but you know they're being swallowed up a bit like the sort of the house of leaves you know the the, the more they uncover the more fills the gap and sort of consumes yeah. them you've also got the conspiracy and the cult i mean it's cultish yeah what the what the great aunt i can't remember what her but what she was getting into. So all of these are working together and working brilliantly because no, no one element is overwhelming any of the others. And they're all feeding into this beautiful mosaic of, of these things. Uh, and, you know, as I say, compared to something like uh, Dodge Rose, um, it just... Well, I'm glad you think so. I think that it, it, you... With, with anything like this that's dealing with a bereavement, I think there is a lot of great fiction that deals with bereavement really, really well, and that looks at the nuanced kind of emotional components of that and the ways that people react. And that wasn't really my intention with this. It was much more an attempt to plummet for, to, 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 to kind of, Examine the situation on a on a on a slightly more abstracted level. It had to be human, and and I and, it, and I set out writing a black comedy, and I would like to think that it it, it lands, you know, largely as 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 humour. Um, but it, I think that you could easily approach this kind of subject and get lost in what is the, I suppose the. If you weren't approaching this from a humorous point of view, I think it would be very, very hard. I can't imagine writing about this scenario and keeping it kind of, well, I suppose a, a different writer would be able to keep it meaningful and, and entertaining, but it had to it had to be preposterous. I mean, the, the, the overriding feeling that I had when we were doing is, this is bonkers. This is bonkers that we're in this situation. There were so many ludicrous paradoxes around the scenario that just felt like they had to be brought to life. And that was something that I found humor in and, 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 and exaggerated massively. Well, de de death is very bureaucratic. <laughs> no well, extraordinarily so. And, and in this instance, 
Um, you know, I wanted to make it hyper bureaucratic in the sense that um, the reality of the way that the sort of the letters and the correspondence worked, I, I had to oversimplify certain components in order to create a system. But then I kind of um, I really wanted to pin down that bureaucracy that was happening on different levels because the letters, this, to, to clarify, the what splices up the main narrative are letters that Great Aunt Pearl received yeah. through the preceding year. So you kind of are, you're leaping back in time and you're seeing letters that she was sent, and these start out with a particular voice, and that voice migrates through lots of different kind of phases where you can see whoever's sending the letters testing her out and finding. Yeah. And, and then and that you can see when they've really warmed up and struck home oh thank you so much yeah. you know this you, know, you can you see feel their excitement coming out and an exploitative kind of euphoria coming out in that voice and i think that was a very much a kind of short story writer in me mm -hmm. that was finding that and and it ended up becoming i think more sophisticated than i probably would have set out to achieve it but think, it just kind of happened that I way. I think modulation is really really important in any kind of fiction writing novel short yeah. stories or whatever and and it's absolutely true that the, the the way those letters sort of gradually increase in in, in just moving it you know the, the, the manipulation on mm. uh, but the beauty is it's ambiguous as to what her we don't know what her response is because we don't right. have letters or the replies that she said, which is right. ge genius, because we so, don't know whether she was suckered in or not. Exactly, yeah. So the whole thing, you do get one letter from her right at the end, which I can't talk about without um, yeah, spoilers. Without sure. spoilers. But the, yes, you are in constantly inferring the nature of her responses, and you are constantly reassessing how smart she's being and her true feelings on the subject you certainly get the sense she's suspicious at first you then get the sense that yes she's warmed up and she's she's on board you then get the sense that she's being frustrating but you don't know how much on purpose and that the tone of these letters is constantly constantly changing to try and unpick her but construct something that she would it's 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 spinning a fiction that she will invest in and it becomes incredibly ornate and you don't really know you never really know who it is or or, or, or how it, it, it they kind of struck upon that particular mode but the the idea of a, a voice that just materializes in front of you and that spins you a compelling yarn and that yarn becomes ever more kind of binding and and compelling the more you listen to it and it and it being perpetually removed from anything tangible in the world these letters just appear to her as they did in real life the letters just pop up in the, in the box or well, what 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 does this voice have to say today you don't you just don't know who's sending it that really interests me so to go back to people writers who have influenced me more recently tom mccarthy is somebody who i began to read very carefully mm -hmm. after um dan james recommended him to me and just to say dan james um, did his, both of our books dan james, author of and is a writer Christ in his own right book. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So he had been recommended Tom McCarthy by somebody in the context of a lot of the themes in Ezra Mars. And when I came to Tom McCarthy, it was like a light bulb going on in terms of his obsession with signals and, um, and feedback loops and things like that. And I began to be, become much more interested in that in the, in the context of, of what I was working on. But to dive into one of the books that influenced um, Life on Other Planets, I was really struggling with how, because a lot of what I was writing for the the idea of this um, individual or or team that was trying to worm its way into Great Aunt Pearl's life with a with a spiritual promise of 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 great health and a, and, a, and a strong kind of mystical component. When I wrote it, just in the guise of the letters that I knew from real life, it just didn't work. It just came, it landed out of the blue. It, it, it didn't, it didn't, you had to have a starting point. And I ended up kind of going back to, I was, I was reading this at the time, which is um, The Blind Assassin by Margaret Atwood. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, have you read this? I'm not no, sure. No, I haven't, no. So it's a huge book, very, and, and, and unlike mine in that respect. But you get these um, Blind Assassin chapters. The, 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 the front end is basically looking at, 
it's, it's written in the first person by a lady whose sister kills herself in the first paragraph. And most of the book is first person narration. It's spliced up a little bit with letters, but it's predominantly spliced up by the narrative within the mode of the blind assassin, which is somebody never named telling somebody else never named who you think is the you work out is the sister that's killed herself Ta and and it what the male speaking in it is a writer and he weaves these blind assassin stories which are these kind of strange science fiction stories that f create their own thread throughout it and i was reading this kind of going do you know what it has to be a, a storyteller there has to be someone telling a story doesn't it that is going to be my my get out in this if i just dive in with the funny abstracted mystical stuff you got no starting point so yeah. what i need is a, is a storyteller and as soon as i realized that i kind of went aha right it's got to be someone ostensibly very very banal who becomes more and more ambitious with the story that they're telling and begins to just layer up detail after detail that if you, when you're reading it in the sequence within the book you kind of go what Clearly, this is somebody spinning her along, but you you can see how it would be it would be believable. And by just ensuring that there was narrative kind of hardwired into this this long con, um, that it just suddenly opened opened it up and kind of gave me room to play with it. See, I find that really interesting because uh, you know I work for a charity, and charity asks nearly always take the form of a story. The person, the story of the person you, that people donating will help. Mm -hmm. What's got scary about the penetration of story into every aspect of life is when you consider things like anti-vaxxers. Yeah. Because they are combating data and fact and science and research with storytelling, you know, of, oh, this kid got sick uh, from the jab or this, this mother died, you know, all this sort of stuff. And thereby they are appealing on Facebook and all the other platforms through pure emotion of story mm. to combat uh, fact and science and stuff. So story is very double-edged, you know, um, and it's, it's becoming more and more prevalent in a, in a society that, that doesn't trust experts, that is suspicious of ideas, that has no ideologies left anymore, which may or may not be a good thing, you know. Um, but story is is flexing its muscle out of all proportion, I feel. So I totally relate to, to what you're saying there. Yeah, so I kind of come at this from a kind of uh, protagonist and, and antagonist kind of point of view, because I kind of, um, I make my living as a copywriter. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how I pay the bills mm -hmm. up until now, until the school extraordinary success of the novel means I can give that up but I have to constantly find new voices and find ways of of, of inviting a business into the into the headspace of somebody else and this was the reason why I approached those components of the novel in the way I did was almost uh, partly out of necessity it was a strength that I had to kind of explore that idea of that penetrating voice um and and also a kind of well if if not that then what you know i've got much stronger sort of sense of intuition with that with that kind of approach to narrative a, a kind of a weaselly uh, kind of narrative than, than raw fiction i thought well it's a point of difference and it's a strength and it's fundamentally in tune with the theme so let's see where it goes but i am so that's my me as kind of villain but I absolutely feel like, as not hero, but certainly from, from an analytical point of view, the things that you've just discussed, the weaponization of story and the weaponization of narrative is something that I think about constantly. Because I think that we've, we've historically had quite, quite a naive sense of what story means. We've taken a lot of fairly kind of glib, promises about i mean you know as you know the stories we tell our children are uh, typically myth and you know fused with propaganda and all kinds of other things that kind of stories have been used to keep people in line you know we haven't got time well, to moral go instruction 
exactly yeah so it but you you will sporadically have a famous novelist or screen like filmmaker or somebody who'll kind of come and say story has such a vital social role we need we humans would die without stories you know we have to have stories in order to understand each other it's and, a shame and, we've only got six then <laughs> say again it's a shame we've only got six stories then. well indeed yeah there is there is that but i think that when you when you take the idea of narrative out of i suppose the grand six true narrative arcs and you say well what if you just create you allow story to infect or not infect but you 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 come at everything with a narrative through a narrative lens how can i turn this into story to achieve a particular goal it asks some very curious questions about how we should be allowed to communicate with, with each other about certain things you know should charities have a monopoly on on owning narrative in in getting their messages across well it feels wrong that you should limit people but it also feels very wrong that anti-vaxxers should go well, that's a good idea from a charity i'll pinch that and we'll just use that in or, or in your case for a long con or, indeed yeah but know. i think it, it's just part of it's part of life it's always been part of human interaction and there are there, there's definitely there's definitely a, a, a human reflex to storify because it helps arrange patterns. Absolutely, yeah. Behavior that enables us to reflect and either to to change that behavior, which I don't think happens very often. But anyway, it it makes sense of what would other, otherwise be random and chaotic. I, I absolutely agree. Yeah, but what you, what I think you have, and this is fairly glib kind of pop analysis, but historically there are certain story types that have allowed for that to happen in a broad cultural way and those are now infused into western culture in a way that we just assume that they are truths they are universal truths so we should kind of embody them and impose them and it's become machinated with sort of industrialized storytelling you think how many movies follow a same narrative structure it gives you no room to really think outside those processes there are there are certain truths within storytelling and screenwriting logic that are unchallengeable and even if they are challengeable they're not challenged very often the idea of underdogs what an underdog needs to go through in order to kind of come out on top and def defeat a bully or you know all, all well, there's, the, there's that movie writing textbook where it sort of says you have to make sure something happens 35 minutes in and 35 minutes before the end it's that so know, it's that numerical i know a reasonable amount about this because i started out writing screenplays right and yeah so a lot of a lot of the three act structure um and uh, of, of movies is bro broken into the eight reels which historically were eight minutes long because yeah. that's a real film yeah. and, 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 and yeah so numerically you can bolt down where events should happen and what they should mean and it's fascinating because in one sense you i used to you see this, this uh, in terms of naivety i used to think about this in quite a naive way I go oh isn't that remarkable that that that's how movies work I'll, yeah. let me get about joining that industry and employing those principles in order to make money and thrive and now I'm removed from that. I kind of go, that's kind of horrifying that we would systemize narrative and, and there would be, an, like my, my kids, you could tell them, uh, give them a scenario and I reckon they could probably sketch out how the, how the story might go after that in, in broad beats. You probably tell them the movie and I don't think it would be hard for them to cotton on because their brains are, are yeah. relentlessly grooved uh instrument for replaying certain and, I, and I, don't, I don't consider there to be a grand conspiracy behind this we must prevent people from thinking for themselves it's a limitation but, of imagination is how i always see it well i don't know that it's necessarily a limitation of imagination it's certainly a water following the easiest path and and i think that storytelling there, is, there are great examples of incredible strong storytelling, particularly in movies. Something like Toy Story rewrote the rules for what kids' films should and could do 
in terms of screenplays and audience appeal and things like that. So it sets the bar and everyone tries to copy that. Yeah. And you might look Probably at that. A limitation of imagination. <laughs> but well, you but you but people people employ imagination in bringing what now becomes a standardized model to life. So you might watch the films that were inspired by that. And some of it will be mechanically the same. And a lot of it will be incredibly imaginative in, in different directions. A lot of screenwriting, they'll take a very, very standard kind of construct. And they'll, it's particularly animations, they'll, they'll explore that in, they'll find a route into it that is incredible, that finds, huge amounts of, of narrative opportunity and they're imaginative in incredible ways but they are all framed within something that's untouchable because it's 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 kind of narrative um what's the word it's kind of ho like a holy logic of human behavior to an extent yeah and that's okay if you want to industrialize storytelling that's great but if you want to actually understand human behavior you can't have thousands and thousands of those films being watched by kids all year long and not have them just think that that's the way things are. It's yeah, a kind of absolutely. propaganda, I think, by acts and not. I don't think it's necessarily intentional. I just think that okay, if that's fantastic storytelling, everyone's going to think that use that approach, and 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 kids are only going to end up watching the stuff that really everything else feels a bit eh, drippy by comparison. Well, they having said that we watched something on netflix the other day called cycle cycle niggin ok mini bellen or something like that it's this danish kids animation and it is mental everything about it is the complete opposite of the of the hollywood kind of machine and it is bonkers. And it has a scene at the end with aphid milking that I will never ever unsee. If you if you skip to sort of ten minutes from the end, it's like uh, David Cronenberg. Then I, I I feel like I'm kind of going off way so, off on the tangent of the tangent here. So I'll come back. We, we will wrap it up, but just say I have written an aphid milking metaphor in one of my books. Amazing. Amazing. Say. Matt, thank you. Is there anything you want to just, you know, append, you know, the book? Well, the one thing I, I, I didn't talk about, and I won't talk about it for long, but I will just kind of... Yeah, go for it. ...get that to it is The Cement Garden, which it was a huge influence on me. The film I watched when I was a teenager, and it kind of seared itself onto my imagination. And when I came to start writing fiction, first book I ever wrote and thought, do you know what? I reckon I could maybe write fiction, was On Chesil Beach by Ian McEwan. And it's not a book I would go back to now. It's not kind of book yeah. I would aspire to write, but I was sat reading it, loving it, thinking, do you know what? Maybe I could do that. And I ended up going back to some of his other work. And when I came to this, it just blew me away again. And everything about it felt like it could inform the kind of book I would want to write. It's so strange. And it's so short and it's a great first person narrative. And there's a lot of similarities between that and life and other planets. Right. Um, so I just wanted to kind of give that a little nod because it's a, it's not a book people talk about very much. I think because Ian McEwan's other work has become much more successful and talked about, not many people talk about the smoke garden, but the film and the book are both very dark little gems. Well, a, a book, a book like Atonement seems so far removed from the cement garden, you know. Exactly. I think he wrote this when he was maybe still a master student. Yeah, I think that's right. At yeah. UEA, University of East Anglia. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So I think he then went on and started doing kind of big novels and serious stuff. And because it was him and Ishiguru were about the same time, students there at the same time, or very similar time, I think. Really, that's interesting. So they certainly both graduates. Right. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, so I think I think this, in one sense, is a curiosity. Although the other one that he wrote that's very short, very dark, The Comfort of Strangers, I don't know yeah. if you read that. Yeah, I have, yeah. They're both gems. You know, I'd go to them probably over any of his other books, really. I yeah. have a sort of a love-hate relationship because anyone who writes a book like Solar is just, you know, you can't treat them ser as a serious writer. It's such a bad book. And yet, you know, I like Saturday. It's flawed, but, you know, it has some worthwhile things in it um atonement obviously 
I think there's a whole other conversation to be had about the idea of the sort of, particularly the male British author who fulfills particular cultural role in their identity. Um, when you compare, say, Ian McEwan to someone like Don DeLillo, I don't feel like, I, I feel like Don DeLillo was constantly challenging himself and I feel like Ian McEwan didn't challenge himself perhaps to explore. I don't, I don't know how you go from something like that yeah. to something like Zola. Where's the bit that, that was interested in hum, humans you know, the, the, the like a I think books in between, like Atonement and Saturday, are perfectly legitimate. Yeah, know. and I mean, there's a great dark thread running through. Um, apologies, what's the one with the balloon? Oh, uh, Amsterdam, is it? No, no, no. Uh, then it's the one with love in the title. Yeah, enduring love. That's right. Yeah, that's it. And I've that's, it, but I haven't read it. That I feel is more. I would just wish he'd kind of explored that that side of his interests more. There's a lot more to be gained, I think, for all of us, if he'd, if he'd have focused on that. But I'll write him a letter, I'll send him an email later and I'll, I'll give him a nudge and hopefully, you know, maybe in a couple of years we'll see something. You can blurb his next book for him. Exactly, exactly. Matt, let's wrap it up there. Um, yeah. Let's say, is there anything you just want to add about where people can find the book or find you? Yep, so I am on Twitter, Matt Cook Writer. Um, MattCookWriter.com is my website and you can find the book on the Lendl Press bookshop.org page uh, I'm not sure about international postage for some well, like I, I asked them if they did ship internationally and they said yes but right. I, don't know, I don't know what the cost of that is in which case uh, bookshop.org uh, for both Life on Other Planets and Stories We Tell Our Children yeah. Thank you. Best of luck for tomorrow. Thank you very, very much. It's been a real pleasure, Mark. Oh, well, we might do a, a, another version of this in, in, in some form, or we might even bring Dan James writer, uh, who was the third, uh, spoke in this wheel. Uh, yes. uh, we, yeah. So, as I say, thanks very much, and best it's of luck a, tomorrow. Thank you very, very much. Cheers, Mark. Thank you.